Uh, this third lecture in uh, the history of ancient philosophy in our presentation is devoted uh, chiefly to Aristotle. I'll be saying at the end some things about what happened after uh, Aristotle in, uh, in Greek philosophy. Uh, and as with uh, Plato and as with the first uh, lecture, uh, what we're able to do uh, in these presentations is touch only the highlights uh, of uh, the period uh, to which uh, we are uh, giving our attention at the moment. Uh, we might use the metaphor of a mountain range and say that we're picking out only the highest peaks uh, in the range and are saying a few things about uh, those uh, heights. Uh, what about everything that falls in between the things that we aren't mentioning? What, what I hope will be put before you or you'll be able to develop as a result of these uh, lectures and then the accompanying reading and writing uh, that you will be doing if you take this course for credit, uh, is you'll be developing a map of the history of philosophy, of this uh, kind of chronological map, and you'll have certain figures, but there'll be gaps uh, between uh, these peaks, and uh, sometimes there'll be a long sweep of time uh, that we will not uh, cover in any uh, significant way uh, in these lectures. But in having the, the, the map, you will have something that can be filled in more and more uh, as you uh, pursue your uh, study. Uh, it is uh, the case with philosophy, and certainly with these lectures, any initial lectures in philosophy, here you're beginning work on the graduate level uh, in, in philosophy, that you are embarking on a, on a road that has no end in this life. Uh, there is not going to be a case where you, it's not going to be the case that at some point you will say, well, now I know all that. Huh? Now I know uh, uh, everything there is to be known in philosophy. I think I'll take up badminton or something. It just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It is something that is endless, not because we don't arrive at certain truths, not because we don't solve certain issues and problems along the way, but because with solutions come new problem. Uh, and there doesn't seem, in that sense, to be any natural uh, into it in this life. But we're being drawn forward because of this thirst that we are uh, for the truth. Uh, and here in philosophy, we are seeing what the human mind could do on its own, so to speak, what it can do unaided. When we move into the next period of uh, the history of philosophy, we are, of course, going to be asking, we're going to be moving into the Christian era and the question is going to arise, what need is there for any continuation of the activity that we're tracing here uh, in uh, the Greeks, uh, in Plato last time, and now in, uh, in Aristotle? Okay. These are, uh, if I may repeat it, these are two of the most important figures in the history of philosophy by common consent. Not to know Plato, not to know Aristotle, is to be illiterate uh, in, in philosophy. Uh, people will rank them differently. Plato is the most important. Aristotle is the most important. Uh, what the agreement will be is that the two of them together represent a duo, a dynamic duo, the likes of which has never been seen since uh, in the course of the history of, uh, of philosophy. So if we devote a lot of time to them, it's not as if we're ignoring figures of equal importance, however important they are. But relatively speaking, they pale uh, into insignificance uh, relative to Plato and, uh, and Aristotle. I mentioned that uh, Aristotle was a member of the Platonic uh, Academy. Uh, he lived in that academy for some 19 years. Uh, indeed, he lived there until the death of Plato. Uh, and it was only then that he founded his own school, uh, the Lyceum. Uh, did the academy disappear with the death of Plato? Not at all. Uh, it had a long, a very long history uh, in, in subsequent centuries, and indeed uh, existed in some form at the time, at 529, when uh, the Emperor Justinian suppressed all the pagan schools uh, of philosophy in Alexandria and in Athens and, and wherever. There, at that time, there was a, an academy uh, to be suppressed by this order of, uh, of Justinian. So, Aristotle did not leave the academy because it ceased to be. He left it to found his own school. And the motivation may, may have been uh, that uh, Aristotle had expected to be named the 
uh, successor of Plato as head of the academy, and in the event, Speusippus, a nephew of Plato, was given that job. And this may have been what precipitated uh, Aristotle's departure and his formation of a new school, the Lyceum. Uh, his followers were to be called the Peripatetics uh, because it was uh, presumably or allegedly uh, his fashion to lecture or talk as he strolled back and forth uh, and his uh, students or followers, uh, companions uh, moving along with him. When we turn to Aristotle, uh, something happens that is not really present in, Arist in Plato. I mentioned that in the middle books of the Republic there is a kind of curriculum that emerges, a kind of order of study uh, that has to be followed if one is to move from immersion in the things of this world to gradual uh, liberation from them uh, to uh, rejoining, so to speak, uh, the divine, the ideal entities, the really real. Uh, with, with Aristotle, however, there, there comes about a far more tight organization of the philosophical enterprise. Now, it's possible to, to trace the origins of anything in Aristotle back to uh, aspects of Platonic doctrine. So that when we hear that Aristotle's first distinction uh, within the uh, uh, philosophy is between the theoretical and the practical, we can, of course, find that or an adumbration of that distinction in Plato himself. But with Aristotle, it takes on this taxonomy, this, this kind of organizing mentality of, uh, of Aristotle uh, takes over. Uh, and he sees the division between speculative and practical philosophy is giving us great genera within which there are a number of sciences included, so that there will be a plurality of theoretical sciences. There will be a plurality of uh, practical uh, sciences. Now you can see that uh, many of the things that Aristotle is um, going to be concerned with, what we will be uh, indicating, will be what we would call natural science. Uh, there's a book of Aristotle on the parts of the animal, on the generation of the animal. And you might notice that and say, wait, I thought we were going to do philosophy. What philosophy is, uh, in Plato and in Aristotle is simply a name for human learning. It encompasses everything uh, that would uh, be a part, uh, a necessary part or a useful part in the learning process which is meant to lead to wisdom. That's why various sciences would be called philosophical by Plato and Aristotle because they have this role to play in our pursuit uh, and quest of, uh, of wisdom. But in Aristotle, you get this kind of sober uh, distinction between the theoretical and the practical and uh, the notion that there is a variety of sciences within uh, each great subdivision. Uh, there seems to be no provision uh, for logic uh, in this uh, division of philosophy. And uh, that's surprising because Aristotle is the father of logic. I mentioned earlier that uh, while for most of the inquiries that he undertakes, uh, he is able to refer to the work of his predecessors. Uh, in logic, he feels he's really breaking new ground, that no one else has ever done this, and consequently, uh, he um, suggests that he's making a far greater contribution uh, than he otherwise uh, would have. There's no mention in the usual divisions of philosophy in Aristotle of logic. And we might wonder, did he forget it? I mean, uh, could he possibly have forgotten uh, all those magnificent works that he devoted to logic, the categories on interpretation, the prior analytics, the posterior analytics, uh, uh, the sophistical refutations, and so forth. I mean, they make up uh, quite a, quite a uh, uh, tidy set of, uh, of works. Uh, it's as if Logic uh, is the modality of the thinking that goes on in the theoretical sciences and in the practical sciences. And while we can consider it apart from that use, uh, it, its real purpose is to guide the thinking about the objects of this science or that science. That, at any rate, is the solution that Boethius gives uh, to this uh, problem when he raises it uh, in the 4th uh, uh, century uh, A.D. 
uh, and sees a dispute between the Peripatetics, the Aristotelian, on the one hand, and the Stoics on the other, as to whether or not logic is a part uh, of philosophy. The Stoics insisting that it was one of the three parts of philosophy, logic, natural science, and ethic. Whereas the Peripatetics, as I'm indicating now, when they divide up philosophy into theoretical and practical, logic doesn't, uh, doesn't enter in. Uh, the reason uh, Boethius gives is that I suggested a moment ago that logic gives us the mode of the thinking, uh, that guides the thinking, that is, uh, bears on certain objects in this theoretical science or that, in this practical science or that, and in that sense doesn't have um, an autonomous uh, existence. What we shouldn't lose sight of when we look at these taxonomic presentations by Aristotle of uh, what philosophy is, what its parts are, and how it's uh, ordered and so forth, is that he never loses sight of the force of the etymology of the term philosophy. What we're engaged in, uh, in all of these sciences, is the pursuit of wisdom. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it's in, l in the light of their relationship to that quest as being necessary for it or useful for it uh, that sciences will be called philosophical. But the ultimate philosophical enterprise for Aristotle, as it was for Plato, is to arrive at such knowledge as we can of the divine. Now, there are going to be a lot of differences between uh, Plato and Aristotle, uh, despite this community. And uh, one is, uh, the chief one, is that Aristotle rejects uh, the whole account of knowledge uh, that uh, is associated with the Platonic ideas, these ideal entities. Uh, Aristotle, uh, in several of his writings, when he outlines what Plato had to say on the topic that he's taking up, uh, will come up with objections to the notion of an ideal entity. For example, at the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethic, when he's asking, what is the human good? What is the good for man? Uh, he will mention Plato's uh, conception of goodness uh, as that to which we must look when we talk about any good thing. Uh, g they participate in goodness. And Aristotle simply dismisses this as irrelevant for the inquiry as to what we ought to do. Uh, it just seems to be a diversion, a distraction rather than, than a help. Well, this objection, those that we find at the beginning of the metaphysics uh, in Aristotle, are not innovations. These would have been standard fare in the discussions in Plato's Academy. Uh, and our mention of the Parmenides of Plato uh, uh, indicates that Plato himself was aware of every objection you could imagine, and then some, uh, to the doctrine of idea. But as I mentioned, that did not dissuade him from holding that there were ideal entities, because to abandon them would be to abandon the possibility of knowledge itself. Now, as we will see when we turn to St. Augustine, uh, he writes a book against the Platonists, Contra Academico, and uh, it's largely because they drew another uh, conclusion uh, from that uh, reminder of Plato's in the Parmenides. Without ideas, no knowledge. Uh, so Aristotle's objection to the Platonic ideas should not be thought of as, as if he suddenly had himself, and independently of his experience in the academy, uh, a insight into the difficulties involved. Now, he accepts as, as irrefutable the difficulties uh, to the ideas that Plato has enumerated in the Parmenides, and Aristotle will offer an alternative account of knowledge, the relationship of intellectual knowledge uh, to sense knowledge, which he feels answers uh, the um, needs of the definition of knowledge without invoking this mysterious realm of transcendent and uh, ideal uh, entities. If uh, Aristotle is to reject the Platonic ideas, 
Uh, and if the Platonic ideas are held by Plato as the necessary condition for there being anything like true knowledge, then Aristotle, who holds that there is true knowledge, is going to have to give another account. Uh, and largely what this will uh, involve at the outset is what is the relationship between uh, our sense experience, what we touch and feel and see and so forth, imagine uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, imagine, and remember on the one hand, and ideas. That is our experience of, of this uh, chair, of this tree, of this uh, uh, and a dog on the one hand, and dog and tree and chair. We give a definition of uh, dog, uh, I suppose if we want a species of dog, let's say a, a cocker spaniel. You give a definition of a cocker spaniel uh, and someone says, which one do you mean? You say, well, that covers any of them. Huh? Uh, if you give a definition of fruit fly, for example, uh, if somebody says, which one are you talking about? He says, I'm talking about any of them. Not about any one in particular, I'm talking about what each of them has in common. Now that is the kind of problem that uh, led Plato to say, well, this thing that they have in common, dogness uh, or uh, fruit flyness, uh, et cetera, is not to be identified with any individual fruit fly. Huh? Uh, but beyond that, uh, Plato would say, how could we possibly identify it with the whole set of individual fruit flies? It doesn't seem to be that as well, uh, either. So he felt compelled to recognize that, as he puts it in the Republic, wherever we have a common noun, we postulate an ideal entity answering to uh, that common noun. If we don't want to go that way, we have to give an account of what we're doing when we give a definition uh, of a kind, uh, of a cocker spaniel, of a fruit fly, and so forth, which is not to be identified with any individual fruit fly or even with the set of individual fruit flies. What does it name? What does it name? This is the so-called, or it becomes, uh, the, the problem of, uh, of uh, universal. Uh, that is, what is the payoff on the meaning of common nouns? Proper names name individuals, uh, Joe, Henry, Amy, and so forth. But common nouns like man don't seem to name those things, certainly in the way proper uh, nouns do. So the question is, what is their meaning? And if their meaning is enunciated in a definition, that seems to float free uh, of the individual. What is Aristotle's account of this? Uh, remember in, uh, in uh, the Platonic dialogue where we uh, saw Socrates sending the slave boy out to look for uh, two equal sticks, and he comes back, and well, they're equal enough, but they're not absolutely equal, are they? Uh, and it's as if equality is something that cannot be derived from uh, what uh, might seem to be instances of equality. The instances always fall short of. Uh, the ideal uh, concept. So where do we get the ideal concept? And in various ways, Plato induces himself and us to think that we must have had them already. And we must have had them because we were more or less directly acquainted uh, with the ideal, with justice itself or equality, uh, piety, courage, and so forth. And that's why we can recognize imitations of it which fall short of it, of course, but we recognize them and they in turn enable us to remember that we knew uh, this, uh, this ideal entity. If not that, what? How is Aristotle going to explain what he means by uh, equality, uh, say of sticks? Um, what he will do is to suggest that equality in the mathematical sense, which is being used here as the kind of measure, uh, is an idealization of what we find in the physical world. Uh, and it has its origin in our experience of physical objects. And it's the idealization is not the name of something uh, that exists in the way in which the physical objects do. In short, Aristotle is suggesting that the whole notion of uh, ideal entities as an explanation of knowledge uh, is uh, idle, it's otios, it's uh, superfluous. So that when we have a notion of what 
man is or a man is, we're not talking about this one or that one, but it's against the experience, our experience of human being, uh, that we are able to express that which they all have in common. But we don't want to say that that which they have in common enjoys a separate existence someplace, as if we had to increase the human population by one when we form this concept of humanity or man himself. These are abstractions uh, that are brought about by the human intellect uh, and which are our means of knowing what individuals have in common. But the abstractions don't answer uh, to some abstract entity. They refer only uh, to the individual uh, of our uh, immediate and, uh, and sense experience. We'll see this returning in, in the Middle Ages in the controversy between St. Bonaventure and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, a controversy that is usually put forward as the dispute between illumination, and this will be associated apparently with uh, Augustine, on the one hand, uh, and abstraction associated with um, Aristotle uh, on the other. But we're, we're seeing it here in its first instance, uh, a prelude, so to speak, um, in Plato, the difference between Plato and Aristotle, and of course this defines the later discussions as well. It's as if the mind is simply supplied with knowledge at the outset. Uh, and this is something which is a kind of shining uh, into the soul on the part of these ideal entities in a presumed earlier existence. So that when we're in this life, we're not going to derive our knowledge of those ideal entities from these pale imitations of them get rid of that antecedent existence of the soul, which, uh, as we will see, Aristotle uh, also rejects. And the only way we're going to uh, be able to explain our ability to form universal concepts is on the basis of um, understanding the objects of sense perception. At any rate, uh, much more, of course, would have to be said of this to make either position uh, commend itself in, the, in, the, in its full force uh, as we find it in Plato and Aristotle. But let this be sufficient to indicate that now with Aristotle in a far more powerful way, uh, there is a underwriting of the effort to know the things of this world as such, not merely as triggers uh, to remember another kind of entity, not so we can get beyond them, but as objects of knowledge in themselves. And as a matter of fact, for Aristotle, the commensurate object of the human mind, the natural thing for us to know, is the nature of physical objects. So much so that the great aspiration of philosophy to know the divine seems to encounter an almost insurmountable difficulty. How can our minds, which are fashioned, uh, as it seems, naturally and directly to know the natures of the th things of our sense experience, how can they arrive at knowledge of things which are not sensible? So Aristotle's got a huge set of problems uh, that face him as a result of his taking more seriously than Plato did the difficulties uh, that confront the idea. Aristotle was able to do that because he felt he could fashion an alternative account of how it is we know things like human nature, equality, justice, and so forth, which did not involve uh, having recourse to another set of entities uh, existing separately and uh, ideally. But having done that, he seems to have locked himself into uh, the physical world as the only thing we can possibly know. Intellectually, we know it more profoundly than we do uh, by way of our senses. But nonetheless, it looks as if we're not going to be able to uh, transcend uh, these, uh, these uh, objects. At any rate, Aristotle has, with Aristotle, we get a new charter uh, for natural science. And as I just indicated, we might seem to have a charter for nothing else. But nonetheless, we do have this. Uh, and it's at this point that we can say something about uh, what he uh, had to reply to the difficulties that Parmenides had raised uh, to the whole notion of a natural science. 
On the one hand, he's got platonic difficulties, and then he's got the Parmenidian difficulty, which suggests that there is no way in which we can seriously accept that there is a multiplicity of entities and that they come into existence and pass out of existence. And one of the ways in which uh, Parmenides uh, can be seen to, uh, uh, one way in which we can express Parmenides' difficulty is to say that we don't want to say that being has come to be from non-being. Because this, this means nothing would become being. Uh, and this would seem to fuse the two, and we are indeed saying what Parmenides reminds us, we can't say that nothing is something. Uh, by the same token, we don't want to say that being comes to be from being, just simply speaking, because that doesn't look like any change at all. So it's as if we're stymied. And what, uh, what Aristotle suggests is that, uh, and this is an indication of the respect in which he holds his predecessor. Now, of course, Plato would give him nothing in the respect that uh, he holds, uh, in which he holds Parmenides. But Aristotle does not recount the position of Parmenides, and I'm thinking now of the first book of the Physics, in order to dismiss it as ridiculous, but rather to suggest that he was led into this position by a very understandable mistake. Uh, and Aristotle will get at it by saying, uh, you know, we do make distinctions as to whether we're attributing a given activity to an agent either as such or in an incidental way. For example, if we say the golfer golfs, that activity belongs to the golfer as golfer. Whereas if we say the golfer uh, presides, uh, says the president, this is something incidental to being a golfer. Why? Because not every golfer is president and not every president is a golfer. So there's an incidental relationship between it. Now Aristotle will offer that distinction uh, as the uh, basis for Parmenides, or that uh, distinction as the way of solving the difficulty that Parmenides raised. Uh, and this will enable Aristotle at one and the same time to refute or answer or solve the difficulty and to say it's a perfectly understandable kind of claim to make if you don't make such and such a distinction. So again, uh, it's not a matter of lording it over or triumphantly uh, refuting one's predecessor, but by moving through the thought process of Parmenides, trying to see how he ended up with a, such a counterintuitive conclusion and being able not to get rid of it simply by saying he must have been crazy, but by analyzing his uh, discourse and, and giving a plausible reason for the mistake. In order to see how um, Aristotle is able to apply the distinction that I mentioned uh, between ways in which we attribute an activity to an agent, the golfer golfs or the golfer presides, we have to uh, go on now and look at the fundamental analysis uh, of the structure of the physical object uh, that Aristotle gives us. And you will recognize, as I present this to you, something that you've already known in some way, not because it's, uh, it's uh, some kind of uh, uh, antecedent or innate knowledge, but because you've heard it all your life. It seems almost to be part of our language. Uh, and that, that uh, is not simply, um, the Aristotelian would say, not simply because of the familiarity of this doctrine and the way in which it's lodged itself, in all modern uh, languages, but because of the accuracy of the, of the analysis uh, that Aristotle gives us. Okay, Aristotle is, uh, as over against Plato and Aristotle, is going to say, we've got to devote ourselves to knowledge of the physical world. Uh, so one of the first efforts uh, in Aristotle's philosophy is an effort to understand natural things. Ta fusica, 
physical object. Uh, and this links them with the very beginnings of philosophy, where, as he uh, presents them, uh, the Ionian philosophers were seeking to explain the nature of things, the phusis of things, that out of which uh, they came, that which would explain the changes that we observe around us. Well, a lot of things have happened. A lot of water has gone over the dam since Thales, we might say, and Aristotle now is in the position of having to sort of re-establish uh, the importance and possibility uh, of, uh, of natural uh, science. Part of that will be to refute uh, or to reject uh, the Platonic ideas. The other will be to, in a head-on way, uh, show that Parmenides can't stop this enterprise from going forward. But in order to see that, again, we have to look at his analysis of uh, physical objects. Now, when Aristotle begins uh, his natural science, uh, his methodological assumption is this. Uh, when we try to understand an area, a range of objects, we first of all arrive at certain universal, generic truths about them. And then we proceed by arriving at more determinate, specific, uh, definite knowledge about the things that fall within uh, the rain. Um, and this is why when we move on from the physics of Aristotle, we're going to be moving into a lot of subdivisions of natural science that have become familiar to us, psychology, biology, uh, and, uh, and the like. He's, uh, the beginnings, the inchoative start at many of these sciences we will find in Aristotle. Uh, how much of what he had to say survives, uh, what we have come to know is uh, a vexed question which we certainly will not uh, address uh, here. But the procedure, the methodology, is to start with the general, the encompassing, and to move towards precision and specificity. So at the outset, he is going to try to determine what is it that everything that has come to be as the result of a change, that's just a roundabout way of referring to physical objects, natural things. What is it that everything that has come to be as a result of a change has in common? Now, of course, there are only particular uh, physical things and only particular changes. So Aristotle will have to take an example uh, which will be as unproblematic as possible and use that as the basis for enunciating a truth which is not in any way tied down to that example, but as a matter of fact will apply to anything of which it can be said it came to be as a result of a change. And Aristotle takes the most domestic, we might say, and simple example possible, that of a young child learning how to play a musical instrument. Uh, and will suggest that by analyzing this, we can find certain truths uh, that are true of any change whatsoever. Even though changes come in all kinds and sorts, nonetheless, they will all have this in common. And on the basis of that analysis of change, we're going to be able to say something that will be true of anything that is a product of or a result of change. So he takes this example of uh, a boy learns how to play the harp. Everyone would agree this is a change from not being able to play the harp to being able to play the harp. That's the change that we're talking about. Who's changing? Uh, little uh, Alcibiades, let's say. So this, nobody's going to say, well, what do you mean calling that a change? What he's looking for is something that anyone would say, yeah, okay, what next? Well, what next is this? Aristotle would say, you know, we can express that change. Uh, in a variety of ways. We can say Alcibiades learns how to uh, play the harp, and we can say from a non-musical uh, person, we get a musical person. Yeah. So uh, w w let, let's, let's drop the proper name Alcibiades and just go, man becomes musical, a human person becomes musical, and let that stand for this right very particular chain, little Alcibiades is learning how to play the harp. So man becomes musical. Uh, we can also say the non-musical man becomes musical. 
uh, and we can say the non-musical man becomes a musical man. Uh. So the, the uh, variation uh, in our expression of that change is not meant to point to further changes, but simply to the variety of ways in which we can express it. But what Aristotle then suggests in effect is this, you know, all of those alternative ways of expressing the change exemplify the form uh, A becomes B. But sometimes we say from A, B comes to B. And if we ask ourselves which of these uh, phrases uh, we could use, uh, or w which of the initial three sentences, I'll provide you with a graphic of this so you won't have to be just following my gestures. Uh, man becomes musical, a non-musical man, the non-musical becomes musical, the non-musical man becomes musical. Uh, which of those sentences could be expressed not in the A becomes B form, but in the from A, B comes to B? And of course, we could say from, uh, from a non-musical man, a musical man comes to be. Why not? From the non-musical, the musical comes to be. But if we said from the man, musical comes to be, we would hesitate. So what, what does this suggest to Aristotle? Uh, we have three different grammatical subjects in the initial three sentences, man becomes musical, non-musical becomes musical, the non-musical man becomes musical, three different expressions uh, of these the three different grammatical subjects, but only one of them expresses the subject of the change. And that is the first, man becomes musical. What does he mean by the subject of a change? That to which the change is attributed and which survives the change. So little Alcibiades doesn't cease to be when he learns how to play the harp. He's there before and afterwards to take our congratulation. But his inability to play the harp is no longer in existence when he's learned how to play it. And we would no longer call him someone who can't play the harp, unmusical man, when he's learned how to play the harp. So those grammatical subjects do not express the subject of the chain. So we have then a subject of the change which survives the chain, and it takes on a characterization which it did not have prior to the change. And we can characterize it prior to the change in terms of the negation of what it achieves at the end of the chain, non-musical, musical man. Okay, so th these are, of course, obvious. You, 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 you're, you're, you're now astounded that uh, uh, anyone would take the trouble to state things so obvious as this. But these are the beginnings of talk about natural objects things that have come to be as a result of a chain. And Aristotle is trying at the level of highest universal universality and the most obvious uh, to state what is the case. And what is the case is that all change, any change, involves a subject. It involves a new determination of the subject and a lack in the subject of that determination before the change occurs. That is the universal statement about change which Aristotle is saying, that's going to cover them all. Okay? Think of a chain, uh, you're going to find that that is exemplified in them. As now to the product of the change, uh, that which results, what, what do we have after the change has occurred? We have the subject and a new designation of that subject. Now, this will be familiar to you, uh, uh, obviously, there's nothing arcane about it, but when you learn that Aristotle's name for the subject of a change was matter, and his name for the new determination of the subject is form, so that the product of a change is going to be seen as a composite of form and matter, you're going to be reminded of the way in which that language has come into uh, our own consciousness, into our own natural languages used all the time. Uh, and we might think this is just Aristotle's influence. It's that. But it's also because he seems to have been, to have picked out something here uh, which is inescapably true. And when we follow this, we say, okay, well, sure, that's true. We're not going to think that we've made some deep and profound uh, penetration into the mystery of reality. And Aristotle isn't proposing 
what he is saying as in any way that, but this is an initial first step. This gets us truths which have the broadest applicability. So obviously they're going to tell us the least uh, true about any of the particular things that we might talk about, but they are a beginning. Now it's on the basis of this analysis that Aristotle is able to apply his distinction between the golfer golfs and the golfer presides, uh, we exemplified it in that way, to Parmenides. And saying Parmenides is saying that uh, being does not come from being. Well, he must mean the previous state of the subject. And of course, he's right. It's not the case that uh, musical comes from however we might characterize little Alcibiades positively prior to this chain. Uh, so too, being does not come from non-being. Non-musical doesn't become musical, but rather it is the subject that become from not being musical comes to be musical. Uh, I could go on, but in this way, Aristotle applies that distinction uh, to Parmenides' difficulty employing his own analysis of change and saying that what, er what Parmenides said is in one sense true, uh, and in an important sense, false. And the important sense in which it is false enables our pursuit of knowledge of the natural world to continue. I mentioned that uh, Plato, in talking about his theory of knowledge, uh, comes up with a account of the human soul, which, however surprising, is nonetheless consistent uh, with uh, the Plato's theory of knowledge. Uh, Aristotle, uh, I've indicated, does not accept uh, the um, explanation of knowledge that his mentor, Plato, has given, namely that it requires and depends upon uh, ideal entities which uh, we have to get in contact with in order to say that we really know. Uh, for, for Plato, the pre-existence of the soul was tied up with that. Aristotle rejecting the ideal entities also rejects the pre-existence of the soul. And for him, the soul is merely the form of a living body. So that when a living thing is born, we can use that very abstract account of change that we just uh, uh, sketched uh, and apply it to the coming into being of a living thing as well. And then soul is simply the name for the form of a living uh, body uh, and would be uh, explained in the same way uh, as the coming into being of any other form. It's not as if you had to have uh, humanity existing uh, independently uh, in order for this man to exist. What you need is these parents who are human beings who, who bring about the existence uh, of this uh, new entity, little Alcibiades, who is also human. So the transition or the community is across individuals uh, of the species and does not entail uh, that our abstract account of what they have in common should exist separately from uh, those individual. Um, the soul then is something for uh, Aristotle uh, that uh, comes into being uh, with the uh, ensouled thing. Uh, requires uh, antecedent causes of the same kind as the effect that uh, is to be produced. In the, in the case of living things, uh, causes which are themselves uh, uh, living. Uh, the human soul, then, for Aristotle, is the first act of a physically organized body having life and potency. This is the definition that he gives us in his work on the soul. And if we parse that out, we would be, f we would be finding that he's talking about it being the form of this kind of substance, a living substance. Uh, so once more, we're back to here a uh, more particular instance of what has come about uh, in um, uh, what is the result of, of any chain. Now this is alarming. This is alarming uh, because the human soul is, however else uh, uh, one regards it, it is the possibility uh, of our attending, whether in this life or beyond, uh, to the divine. 
Uh, and if the human soul is being described simply as a component of the living thing that a man is, uh, having no existence independent of that, of course, uh, our destiny, uh, our conception of our destiny is radically altered. Does Aristotle have a account or proof for the immortality of the soul? Well, he does. It's a very complicated proof, and it has none of the dramatic allure uh, of the Platonic uh, account in the, uh, in the Phaedo. But it is tied to our ability to know immaterially material things. Uh, one of the things that led Plato to the positing of ideal entities was his recognition that modally, at least, our concepts are not tied down to individual instances of them. And the whole process of abstraction, which we have contrasted with uh, Plato's uh, account of the origin of our ideas, of our concept, the whole process of abstraction, Aristotle argues in what is easily one of the most complicated arguments in his work, the process of abstraction reveals to us that there is a there is a psychological activity, there is a vital activity of human being which is not simply the activity of matter, which is not merely an operation of the material. If he can prove that, as he, as he does in the third book of the De Anima, then he is able to say this, a soul that has an activity uh, and a capacity uh, to operate immaterially cannot simply be an aspect uh, or a component of a material object. In short, on the basis of this, Aristotle is able to claim that the human soul does not cease to exist at the end of life, at death. Now, he's got a huge problem that Plato didn't have. For Plato, after death, the soul returns to its natural condition. Doesn't have a body, who cares? That was simply an impediment anyway. But for Aristotle, the soul is the form of the body. That's how it's initially understood. So even if he is able to argue successfully that the human soul can exist independently of the body, it's an anomalous kind of existence. It's an unnatural kind of existence. Now, as we'll be seeing when we turn to medieval philosophy, the fathers of the church were enamored of Plato, as how could they not be? They knew Aristotle much less perfectly, of course, but there was a kind of sense that Plato is on the same page as the Christian believer. He's got this sense of the destiny of the soul uh, and so forth, that it was very congenial that this life is merely a test and we're destined for something beyond uh, and the like. Whereas in Aristotle, you have a soul that exists beyond its uh, uh, coexistence with the body, but that's not right. It's not the way it was meant to exist. Well, from a Christian point of view, as we'll indicate, the doctrine of the resurrection, so to speak, comes to the, to the rescue uh, of Aristotle's conception of immortality. Because one of the great Christian beliefs, of course, is that uh, Christ's resurrection from the dead presages the eventual resurrection uh, of all human beings, that is, the restoration of the soul to uh, to its body. So the ultimate condition of human beings uh, in Christianity is for the soul to be rejoined to its body. In Plato, that's far more of a difficulty. The whole notion of the resurrection would look like returning to an imperfect condition rather than being restored uh, to the appropriate uh, uh, condition. So we're going to uh, uh, end these remarks uh, on Aristotle, someone up in the air. Uh, we've got him talking about the immortality of the soul. There is something, in short, uh, which exists which is not material. That will open up for him a science, uh, the science of metaphysics, which is the location uh, within the Aristotelian writings in which he will try to arrive at more appropriate knowledge of God. He has shown that there is a prime mover uh, in the physics, uh, that uh, you cannot have a world made up simply of move movers. There must be a first unmoved mover. In the metaphysics, he's going to try to uh, describe God 
uh, in a, a more uh, appropriate or in a less inappropriate uh, way. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this is the answer, uh, or this involves the answer to the difficulty that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that is, Aristotle seems to describe human knowledge uh, in such a way that has the great advantage of validating our efforts to understand scientifically the things around us, but has the grievous disadvantage, as it seems, that it cuts off the human mind from any ability to know things beyond the natural, beyond the, the physical. Uh, Aristotle faces up to that objection, and he wants to say that for the human mind, he uses this image at the outset of his metaphysic, for the human mind to turn to the most noble things, uh, to the highest things, to the divine things, is like an owl in the daylight. There is just so much intelligibility that the human mind is incapable of, of grasping it directly. What the human mind seems directly to be fashioned for, uh, epistemologically, is knowledge of physical object. But for Aristotle, this is the way, this is the way to come to knowledge of things which are not material. Uh, the allusion that I made to the argument for the prime mover, this is, a, this is a place in the natural science of Aristotle where the data that he is considering force upon him, as he argued, the recognition that there has to be something that is not just another item in the, nat the set of natural things. The prime mover is not another natural object. So here you get this intimation of reality uh, beyond the physical reality. The proof for the immortality of the soul is another uh, such opening out of natural science to the recognition that to be and to be material are not identical. Aristotle will pursue that, as I indicated, that clue or these intimations in the metaphysic, a science now not of natural being, not a science of uh, quantified being mathematics, but a science of being as being. Uh, and he will now take a very generalized look at the things that are the commensurate object of the human mind, natural substances, and find in them, discern in them, characteristics which could be, could be instantiated in things which are not material. In other words, he can extrapolate from material substances to the source or causes of those substances. But the culminating, the culminating discussion uh, in the metaphysics uh, is in Book Lambda, where Aristotle puts before us not simply a god who is the first mover of the physical universe, but as he describes him, thought, thinking itself. God is mind uh, above all. Uh, and it's as if in order to talk about God as a mind, how can we talk about him? The only way we can do it is to extrapolate from what we know about thinking in our own case and to remove from it what uh, are clearly imperfections and defects in our own mode of knowing. And when we have come up with a purified concept of that, we end up with Aristotle's phrase, thought, thinking itself. And this is the ultimate, this is the ultimate reach of philosophy for Aristotle. And it has its moral match in his discussion of contemplation uh, in his Nicomachean Ethics. The ultimate goal of philosophy for Aristotle, uh, as for Plato, is not simply to have a impersonal or dispassionate understanding uh, of the way things are, but it's to have an appetitive orientation uh, to the good and the true and the beautiful. And contemplation, as it shows up in the Nicomachean ethic, is seen as the upshot of uh, the development in the moral life. It's when the moral virtues have been acquired uh, that the mind is released, so to speak, uh, to contemplate the divine and is fit uh, to contemplate the divine. Of course, from the point of view of religious faith, what Plato or Aristotle have had to say about the divine and the life beyond this one will seem to be very meager indeed. 
uh, and it's possible to stress that, or it's possible, uh, as many Christian philosophers have done, to say, isn't it amazing what the human mind, unaided by revelation, was able to learn about the nature of human existence, human destiny, and indeed some intimation of the existence and nobility of God himself.